November 17, 2016. It's a breezy autumn day in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma is the second largest city in the state of Oklahoma. It has a population of a little over a million people. It's a great place to live. One of the things that I'm proud of about Tulsa is we have Black Wall Street here. Because of the attention that Black Wall Street has gotten in the past few years, we have a lot of traffic coming through Tulsa. And because it is such a growing city, you know, the crime kind of grows with it. The growing crime rate keeps the Tulsa Police Department busy. Police were working on a case where a man named Carl Duke Harris had been shot in a gang-related incident. We're investigating the shooting, and the victim at that time was not expected to live. He had multiple gunshot wounds. What police don't know is that they are about to get a phone call that will take this case in an even darker direction. Well, the Tulsa Police Department receives a tip uh, through Crime Stoppers that there was a possible murder that had occurred that the police department was unaware of. The caller tells police that 23-year-old Courtney Palmer had been beaten to death in an apartment. The name is familiar to police. We have an active case going with Courtney Palmer. Courtney was a witness to the shooting of Carl Harris. Police had been trying to contact him for a few days to give a statement. Courtney Palmer had been involved in other crimes, but he was not known to be a violent criminal. The caller tells police that not only was Courtney brutally beaten to death, it gets worse. The caller says that Courtney's body was fed to pigs. We've had at least one more victim that has allegedly been fed to the hogs in, in Muskogee. And that person has never been found. So that Crime Stoppers tips definitely has some likes to it. We take it seriously at that point. Despite Courtney being a criminal and having a long rap sheet, most of the officers were fond of Courtney. Courtney is kind of a mainstay, even though he's 23 years old. I knew him when he was eight or nine. He ran the streets and I was working patrol. Unfortunately, when Courtney was a teenager, he kind of got involved with that street life. Courtney got roped into the wrong crowd and made friends with members of the infamous Crips gang. Despite his criminal involvement, Courtney was well loved. He was known as a jokester. He was known for his smile, that he can light up any room that he walked in. He can lift anybody's mood if they were feeling down. He was gang related, but it was obvious to us that Courtney cared about his family. His family cared about Courtney. Courtney was a father to three children. They were the number one priority in his life. Courtney was a family guy. He had two daughters and a son. He stayed actively involved in his children's lives. The children were by two different women, even though the relationships didn't last. He still stayed engaged with his children. Courtney had a big heart. He would do anything for anybody. Just a very generous person was the impression I got about Courtney. Everybody kind of knew Courtney Palmer. Courtney has some issues, but he was always respectful. So who would want to kill this young father? And why? Police ask the tipster for more details. So the anonymous tipster alerts police that Courtney was killed because there were rumors on the street that he was involved in setting up Carl Duke Harris, who was shot. Police knew Courtney was a witness to this shooting, but this was the first time they heard he may have actually been involved. The tipster claims a woman named Charletha Mack lured Courtney to her house two days after Duke Harris's shooting. This isn't the first time police have heard the name Charletha Mack. Allegedly, Courtney Palmer was at Charletha Mack's house up north. We know that house. There's other killers that have been in and around that house. So when that name comes up, it leads credence to the Crime Stoppers tip. It just starts steamrolling that. All indications is that Courtney is going to be dead. Tulsa police officers know they need to speak with 39-year-old Charletha Mack as soon as possible. They obtain a search warrant and rush to Charletha's home, hoping the tipster was wrong. 
We go up and knock and announce at the door. I was the supervisor on that warrant, so I was outside the front door. The door slowly opens, and Charlitha Mack appears. Charlitha's demeanor at the time of the search warrant was initially defiant, that could not believe we were there. So what? It was what I remember her telling me. So what? Charlitha claims she had no idea what happened to Courtney. She hasn't seen him in days. Police execute the search warrant, looking for any signs of foul play. The house is not in disarray to the point where you would expect if a murder had occurred, a beating like we heard. We don't find Courtney. We don't find evidence that Courtney has been killed. But Sergeant Walker and his team don't give up that easily. We had included our crime scene folks coming with us as part of the service of the search warrant. That doesn't always happen, but we knew we were going to need their expertise in luminoling. With the help of the luminol, crime scene investigators are able to uncover evidence in the bathroom that was invisible to detectives' eyes. The luminol that was in the bathroom reacted in several places the bathtub, the bathroom sink. So that lets us know that it's not just somebody that nicked their finger and they let a little bit and they wiped it up. It kind of is reminiscent to a beating and that's a key part into our investigation. There's evidence that something extremely violent happened in that room. This has started us to believe that we've got a murder and we've got people hiding it. So it's just gonna be a matter of time. November 17th, 2016. While investigating the shooting of Carl Duke Harris, police in Tulsa, Oklahoma, have received a tip that Duke's friend, 23-year-old Courtney Palmer, has been beaten to death and fed to pigs. Many people believed that Courtney had been involved in setting up Duke when he got shot, but police did not believe that that occurred. The tip has led them to the home of Charlitha Mack, where the tipster claims Courtney was killed. Though Charlitha contends she has no idea what happened to Courtney or where he is. Her demeanor was one that we would expect of somebody that's been talked to by law enforcement before, used to getting her way. However, there are clear signs of a violent altercation in Charlitha's bathroom. This was not a lot of blood, but it was a significant amount to know that what our investigation was leading us to is true. Somebody got beaten in the bathtub, on the tile, and at the bathroom sink. As CSI documents the findings, Charlitha Mack is taken back to the police station for an interview. Charlitha, once she was in the interview room, finally decided that the truth was about the only thing that she could keep straight. Her lies were just not going to hold up. That's usually the case. So when she started telling us what happened, it fit absolutely with the investigation. Police ask Charlitha about her relation to Courtney Palmer. Charlitha tells police that Courtney often hung out at her house. He had a baby with her niece, and she considered him like a nephew. Charlitha says on the night in question that there were two other people staying at her house, 39-year-old Gerald Lowe and his girlfriend. Mac, when we interviewed her, only knew Gerald Lowe. She knew Gerald Lowe's girlfriend, but did not know her identity. And of course, when she lies about one thing, we're going to call a liar on that one too. But she was stuck with the not knowing. Charlitha explains that Gerald, like many others in their circle, was angry about the shooting of their mutual friend, Carl Duke Harris. Gerald believed the rumors that Courtney had something to do with Duke getting shot. Charlitha says she doesn't think Courtney was involved, but Gerald was adamant that he was to blame. Around 3 a.m., Courtney showed up to Charlitha's house. 
she explains that Courtney just pops in, and that's totally understandable for Courtney's behavior. Courtney would show up when Courtney showed up, and he's obviously feeling a little bit triggered by the shooting of Duke, and he's talking to Mac about all that. Charlitha tells police she had no idea the horrors that Gerald and his girlfriend had planned. Gerald quickly got violent with Courtney. He was slapping him around, kind of pushing him around, trying to get some understanding of what happened, his involvement would do. As Gerald was assaulting Courtney, he encouraged his girlfriend to get involved. Once she got involved, she took things to a whole new level. The woman sat on Courtney's lap, straddles him, and takes out a pocket knife and slashes him on the cheek. Charlitha says the couple used the knife to force Courtney into the bathroom, where things got even worse. Charlitha says Courtney was telling them he had nothing to do with the shooting, but they wouldn't relent. She says she was in a state of shock, too terrified of Gerald and his girlfriend to intervene. She could hear them beating him for several hours. She gave gruesome details as what was going on, and she allowed that to happen. I mean, it is her house. At any point, she could have called 911. It's hard to feel sorry for Mac at that point. She confirms that Gerald's girlfriend left the residence at one point, went to the convenience store down the road to get bags of ice. When the girlfriend arrived back at the residence, Gerald forced Courtney into the bathtub where it was filled with cold water and ice and Courtney was forced to remain in the bathtub. They then poured boiling hot water on Courtney as well. Finally, with a rush of adrenaline, Courtney leaps out of the bathtub and tries to fight for his life. The tussle progresses into the hallway. When Courtney started fighting back, Gerald grabbed him and began strangling him, at which time the girlfriend began to kick Courtney in the face and chest. So at some point, Courtney stopped moving. He stopped breathing. And it was at that point, Courtney was dead. Charlitha says that she was petrified. She watched as Gerald and his girlfriend grabbed blankets to wrap Courtney's body and loaded it into a plastic tub. They took it out to Gerald's white pickup truck. Gerald and his girlfriend then drive away. Police ask Charlitha where the couple went. Was Courtney actually fed to pigs, like the Crime Stoppers tipster reported? As for what happened with the body after that, Charlitha said Gerald told her that he got rid of the body in a rural area outside the city. With only one name to go on for now, detectives put out an APB for their new prime suspect, Gerald Lowe, and his white pickup truck. Gerald had a long rap sheet, which included multiple drug charges, as well as multiple offenses of assault and battery. But who is his girlfriend and alleged co-conspirator? Detectives are about to get one step closer to finding that out. She's walking through the store like she doesn't have a care in the world. There's no doubt this is their girl. Of course, all murders are tragic, but boy, the, the way it happened, who it happened to, is kind of tragic. Courtney Palmer is one that sticks out. You just have to say that name and, and we know what you're talking about. A lot of us knew Courtney Palmer from when he was a little child. Courtney was respectful to law enforcement. I mean, he was doing illegal things, but he wasn't doing them to us. So that hurts us just a little bit. In November of 2016, detectives investigating Courtney Palmer's disappearance and possible murder have just gotten the lead on two suspects, 39-year-old Gerald Lowe and his unidentified girlfriend. Gerald has a long history with the law, but law enforcement are still trying to figure out who his girlfriend is and where they are now. A witness to the crime, Charlitha Mack, has told police the gruesome details that she claims led to Courtney's demise. But one detail in particular piques detectives' interest. 
During Mac's interview, when she finally decided to tell us what happened inside the house, she said at some point, the girlfriend went to the Quick Trip to get some ice. And that really is a key piece because at the Quick Trip, they're gonna have a video surveillance. Detectives let Charlitha go, for now, and retrieve the convenience store surveillance footage from the night of November 16th. As they're viewing the footage from the surveillance, they see a white pickup truck pull into the lot in front of the convenience store, the same vehicle that Gerald has been known to drive. The suspect is wearing a distinctive hooded sweatshirt with cow written on it. You know, and we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Not that Cal is unusual, but it's not prevalent in a, a big 12 state, you know, so we're not gonna see a Pac-10 pac state come in. The surveillance video shows the woman casually walking through the store, purchasing snacks along with four bags of ice. She makes the purchase and then leaves the store. Detectives conclude this must be Gerald's mystery girlfriend but they still don't know her name. Once we get low identified from the interviews and the information and all the surveillance video that we're gathering from the quick trip, everybody gets sent this information with those pictures on it. So maybe somebody knows that and will eventually call us and give us some information. Not long after releasing the still photographs to the media, police get a tip. But it's not on the girlfriend. It's about Gerald. The tipster says he has seen Gerald Lowe at Monica Scott's apartment. Monica just happens to be Courtney Palmer's ex-girlfriend. Could Monica be Gerald's co-conspirator? Perhaps she started a relationship with Gerald after ending things with Courtney. Detectives head to her apartment in hopes of getting to Gerald Lowe before he makes a run for it. That information led us to the search warrant of Monica Scott's apartment. We knocked on the door, she answered the door. When detectives arrive at Monica's apartment, they find her, but there is no sign of Gerald Lowe. It's also clear Monica isn't the woman from the convenience store video. We had talked to her, told her why we were there, and she was very cooperative at that point. Detectives show Monica the images of the woman from the surveillance footage and she is able to identify her right away. Monica immediately identifies the woman as 25-year-old Michaela Riddle. Michaela Riddle had kind of a rough life. She didn't have a very good upbringing. I think she had been abused in different ways. So she didn't have a very good life. Michaela had difficulty holding down a steady job. That meant she had to couch surf from friend to friend's house to keep a roof over her head. What Michaela really longed for was a man to help take care of her. Then she met Gerald Lowe. Although he was a decade older, he was handsome and charming and had a smooth demeanor. Unlike Michaela, Gerald had a decent upbringing, but he chose to rebel and live a life of crime. Gerald Lowe, he was a very polite, very respectful young man. He used to do construction work and carpentry work, and that's how I knew him. And so I don't know that he had had such a difficult background where he couldn't have done something different with his life. Gerald was connected to the local chapter of the Crips, and he had a lengthy criminal record, but he kept Michaela safe. He made her feel comforted and protected. The two quickly became inseparable. Gerald didn't have a home of his own, but Michaela didn't mind. She was used to the couch surfing lifestyle. Michaela's hope was that they'd be able to lift each other up and forge a happier future together. Even though they didn't have a house of their own, as long as they had each other, they were home. According to Monica, Gerald and Michaela had been living with her, but she said she had not seen them in a few days. They absconded kind of like, you know, gypsies would do. Monica tells police she and Courtney had a fight and broke up a few days before he disappeared. But when she heard he was missing, she was distraught. Monica tried to reach out to him via phone, but she wasn't able to get in contact with him. She believed something terrible had happened to Courtney and she started crying. 
Michaela was at the house at the time and asked why she was upset. She admitted she was crying over Courtney. Instead of comforting her friend, Michaela says something that chills Monica to the bone. That's when Michaela responded, oh, you're never gonna see him again. When Monica asked what she meant by that, Michaela said, this is about to be some first 48 stuff. So that was a clear indication to Monica that her ex-boyfriend, Courtney, had been murdered. Monica admits that she should have called the police right then and there, but she was scared and confused. She was hoping that Courtney would just come back home and everything would be back to normal. Detectives ask Monica if she can give them any information that will help track down these potential killers. Monica confirms to police that Gerald and Michaela do drive a white pickup truck, but she has no idea where they are now. Then, Monica supplies them with one invaluable piece of information. Michaela's phone number. Riddle's phone number, that's a key piece of evidence in any murder investigation. Uh, if we can get that phone number, then we can start doing work on that. This is like gold for detectives. With this, they can track Michaela's general location. Police are one step closer to getting justice for Courtney Palmer. Now, it's only a matter of time. So they know that apprehending Gerald and Michaela is going to be the key to solving this case. Of 2016, Tulsa police finally have a name for the female co-conspirator in the alleged murder of 23-year-old Courtney Palmer. Police now believe that Gerald Lowe and Michaela Riddle are responsible for what happened to Courtney, but they still haven't found them or Courtney's body. Now that they have Michaela's phone number, detectives hope it can lead them to where she and Gerald are hiding out. Once Monica Scott was able to give us Michaela Riddle's phone number, we were able to get the GPS phone logs from the phone company, and then that gave us an area of town where there's several apartment complexes. It was determined that the best course of action is for the police to just kind of slowly patrol these different apartment complexes and hotels in the hopes that they would be able to find this white pickup truck in one of the parking lots. On December 4th, 2016, police finally find what they're looking for. We had located the white pickup backed in and then from there we were able to get that locked down surrounded surveillance set up on it we were not going to lose the truck our intel person was able to locate and determine that gerald lowe's uncle stayed in an apartment right there where that truck was located and then the investigation really starts to focus in on that particular area we spend a number of hours surveillance on the truck, and then we decide to go up and knock on the door and get after Michaela Riddle and Gerald Lowe. It's kind of the most dangerous part of our investigation up to this point, because we're going to go and get two killers out of an apartment. Prepared for the worst, police make their way to the apartment door. We don't know what to expect. The most dangerous part of it was the actual confronting of Lowe and Riddle. And we decided to go in and pop the door open. With tensions high, police enter the apartment. To their surprise, it appears empty. Then we search an apartment for killers. Realizing all hope is lost, Gerald Lowe comes out with his hands up. We make a voice contact with Lowe and we get him out. And Riddle is subsequently also found inside the apartment. But Michaela is not going down without a fight. Mostly I remember from them was Riddle's demeanor. She was just hateful and mean. And if she could hurt you, she would. So we had to be on our game to make sure we took her into custody without anybody else getting hurt or her getting hurt also. Lowe, on the other hand, was more agreeable. I think he realized that he was just going to take his chances explaining circumstances as opposed to fighting us at the apartment. Once they're in custody, it's kind of a sigh of relief. Gerald and Michaela are placed in the squad cars while detectives scour the apartment for evidence. 
It was obvious they were kind of couch surfing because their clothes were just there. They weren't hanging in the closet, so they weren't going to have a residence there. So it allows us to search the limited area, and then we're able to find the cow sweatshirt, which is key to Riddle's involvement in this case. Satisfied with the evidence collected, authorities take the couple back to the station for questioning. Up first in the hot seat is Gerald Lowe. Detective White goes in there and explains why he's here. He kind of understands that, yeah, we're there for a reason. He knows what he did, but he still is in denial. When confronted with Charlitha Mack's statement about his and Michaela's involvement in Courtney's brutal murder, Gerald shuts down. Obviously, he has the right to remain silent. He imparts that right to an attorney. And once that happens, we're kind of done. So we leave the room. Hands tied with Gerald, detectives hope his girlfriend will be more helpful. She's as hateful in the interrogation room as she was in the apartment. Not cooperative. She's telling us that we should all have that information. And of course we did. But usually what we want to do is start a conversation and gather some type of rapport with her. But she was unreportable, if that's even a word. Michaela plays dumb. She denies knowing Courtney Palmer, Charlitha Mack, and Monica Scott. The only person she claims to know besides Gerald is Carl Duke Harris, the man many believed Courtney set up to be shot. I do remember her making some comment throughout this case that Harris was her cousin, so there's family blood if you can believe her. Detectives try hitting her with the hard evidence. When shown the still photographs from the surveillance video, she denies being the person in the video. She was not gonna have any of it from us. And uh, basically the, the interview was shut down, mainly because it was obvious that she wasn't going to give us anything. She wasn't going to cooperate. She demands to be taken to her cell so that she can go to sleep. With neither suspect cooperating, it's more important than ever that investigators find Courtney's body if they hope to get convictions. Detectives are afraid that they may not ever be able to find the body of Courtney Palmer. But before long, they'll get another tip that could help them do just that. The caller says that Courtney's body was fed to pigs. The scene was horrendous. It was just awful, the disregard that was shown for the young man. December 2016. Police in Tulsa, Oklahoma finally have their prime suspects in custody for the tragic disappearance and alleged murder of 23-year-old Courtney Palmer. Investigators believe Gerald Lowe and Michaela Riddle tortured Courtney for hours and ultimately strangled him to death. Obviously, after the arrest, we still have to locate Courtney's body. We want to put Courtney out there on the media. Here are the people that are involved. We show the truck, we show Low, we show Riddle. And it doesn't take long for another tip to come in. The next day, we get a phone call from Muskogee. So it all starts to roll downhill at that point in locating Courtney. According to the tipster, Gerald had been seen living in an abandoned farmhouse miles away in Summit, Oklahoma. Apparently this area used to be a pig farm or somebody raised pigs there before. It was just kind of a desolate country area. There was a neighbor who lived next door who knew Mr. Lowe, who had said he had seen him there around the time these events were happening. They head out to Summit in search of Courtney's remains or the pigs who ate them. We're able to locate the house that the caller called in after viewing our media presentation and search the premises. Inside the dark, abandoned home, investigators scour for any sign of Courtney or evidence that might connect their perps to the scene. They actually find a vacuum erection device and a sock. They know they can test these for DNA and hopefully tie Gerald and Michaela back to the scene. Unfortunately, they don't find any other evidence, such as the pocket knife used against Courtney. 
they don't find the plastic tub that the couple supposedly used to transport the body. In the backyard, investigators don't find any pigs, but they do find something very disturbing. In a fire pit was the remnants of a human body. The body was found just burned in a heap on a mattress, I believe. The body there that was burned in the fire pit is unrecognizable to us. It's obviously a human skull. You can see that. So we know we have a body, but we know who we're looking for. At that point, I think we were confident that that's going to be Courtney's body. The remains are sent to the lab for DNA testing. And it is confirmed that they are, in fact, Courtney Palmer's. We were able to make notification to Courtney's family at that time. Every time we tell a family their loved one is dead, and it doesn't matter if it's a Courtney Palmer with a rap sheet or somebody that is 18 years old that doesn't have a rap sheet, the reaction is the same. The family cries, and they should, and it hurts. And that takes a little piece of us, too. Lab DNA results also come back on the sock and the vacuum erection device found inside the abandoned home. It's a match to Gerald Lowe and Michaela Riddle. Michaela and Gerald were charged originally with assault with intent to kill because we didn't have the body, obviously. Once Courtney's body was discovered in Muskogee, we upgraded the charge to first degree murder. Charletha Mack is also charged with accessory to murder. Mack was charged with accessory to a felony. And that's, you know, obviously because it was her house. She didn't call, she didn't intervene. As investigators build their case for trial, they begin piecing together what led up to Courtney Palmer's gruesome homicide. It all started on November 8th, 2016, when Carl Duke Harris was shot in an apartment complex. Duke was Michaela's cousin. She, Duke, and Gerald were really close. From what investigators can gather, Courtney was the one that dropped Duke off at the apartment. So that's where the rumors about Courtney being behind Duke's shooting started. Michaela and Gerald had bought into the rumors, hook, line, and sinker. Gerald was used to meeting violence with violence. Michaela did not have a violent criminal background like Gerald. She had never been involved in anything like this. But she trusted her man, and she agreed to go with the plan. Michaela loved Gerald so much, she was willing to do whatever he wanted. On the night of November 10th, Gerald and Michaela went to Charletha Mack's house and waited for Courtney to show up. Around 3 a.m., Courtney arrived. He was talking to Charletha when Gerald and Michaela attacked, attempting to get him to admit to setting up Duke. They tortured and beat him to death after he refused to admit that he was involved in the shooting of Duke Harris. Once Courtney was dead, they loaded his body in a plastic tub and drove it out to the old farmhouse where Gerald sometimes stayed. Investigators believe the first thing they did when they arrived was have sex on a mattress in the abandoned house. They then went outside and set Courtney's body on fire along with the mattress they just used. Soon, Police will learn that this crime was even more senseless than they could have imagined. Turns out Duke Harris is alive. He survived the shooting. And he is adamant Courtney had nothing to do with setting him up. Michaela and Gerald had done all this to Courtney for nothing. I think the main thing about this case that stood out to me was it was so heinous. 
I don't want to make murder sound like it's run of the mill, but this wasn't a run of the mill murder. I mean, the parties involved in this case went to great lengths to torture Courtney, to dispose of his body in a disrespectful way, but the torture of it, I think, was very disturbing to me. You didn't normally see crimes committed in this horrific of a manner in the black community. This is it. One play. This is when we find hey, out. Hey, quick question. Huh? Student body math proficiency. When we say it's good, fair, satisfactory, what? like a percentage, if you had to guess. Get out of here, man. Understood. Security. Hey, grab it. Great student teacher ratio. Marcy! We gotta go! Marcy! We have to go! We bring you the real in depth school info. What were you thinking? I don't know. I don't know. Bing dong. Homes.com. Welcome to Sapphire Lounge by the Club. This is more than a place to hide away before you get away. It's a main course before the main event. It's the best seat before boarding. It's a real reason to arrive early. This is what an airport lounge is supposed to be. Chase Sapphire Reserve. Make more of what's yours. Jimmy Butler loves Hulu Plus Live TV. It's got over 95 live channels. But Jimmy Butler's butler is old school. He doesn't realize Hulu Plus Live TV is like cable. Only better. Buckets! Earning a degree in the military is hard. Doing it with a family, a job, and deployments is almost impossible. But National University's four-week courses help me balance my life and my military schedule. They don't just see you as a student. They see you as a person with a life. Now I'm a highly decorated veteran, a cyber operations chief, and most importantly, a role model to young Marines and my two daughters. Good job. They say you're better safe than sorry. But they say a lot of things. In 1953, they said our whiskey recipe tasted perfectly fine. So we burned it and made something better. Maker's Mark. Make your mark. There's nothing better than a Subway Series footlong, except when you add on an all-new footlong sidekick. We're talking a $2 footlong churro, $3 footlong pretzel, and a $5 footlong cookie. Every epic footlong deserves a perfect sidekick. Order one with your favorite Subway Series sub today. Investigators in Tulsa, Oklahoma, are building their case against suspects Gerald Blow and Michaela Riddle. The couple is accused of torturing 23-year-old Courtney Palmer to death over an unsupported rumor. So the rumor is that Courtney set up Carl Duke Harris to be shot on November 8th. But police have not been able to substantiate the claim that Courtney was behind it. All Courtney did was drop Duke off at the apartment where he was shot. And soon, investigators receive stunning news that proves Courtney's murder was just as senseless as they thought. Carl Harris did recover from the gunshot wounds. Whether it's a full recovery, I'm sure you shot six or seven times, you're, you're going to feel it for the rest of your life. But uh, as far as I know, he's up and mobile. With Carl Duke Harris healed enough to speak, detectives are able to ask him about the night he was shot. Duke says he doesn't know who the shooter was, but is 100% certain that Courtney did not set him up. Courtney was innocent all along. You know, it was really unfortunate that his life would be cut short over a rumor. There was no evidence or proof that he was involved in the shooting of Duke. Prosecutors make a deal with Charlitha Mack. In exchange for two years in prison and 18 years on parole, she agrees to testify against Gerald and Michaela in court. Is she pleads guilty to her accessory charge? From everything that came a lot with Lowe and Riddle, this was not going to end well for them. In December 2019, faced with the death penalty, Gerald Lowe pleads guilty to all the charges against him. Kidnapping, first degree murder, committing a gang-related offense, and desecration of a human corpse. He is sentenced to life in prison plus five years. 
In Gerald Lowe's case, I was the sole fact finder and sentencing authority, if you will. He didn't have the benefit of a jury. As a judge, I weigh all the facts and what his role was in the event. And in my opinion, I gave him the sentence that I thought he deserved. In early 2020, Michaela Riddle decides to take her chances at trial. With regard to Michaela, I think the defense strategy was to hone in on how horrible her life had been and how she would do anything to keep the love of Gerald Lowe. Luckily for Michaela, the jury is convinced. When the case goes to the jury, they agree that Gerald was the mastermind behind the murder and that Michaela took part in the horrific crime to make him happy. Michaela's charges are reduced to second degree murder, kidnapping, and desecration of a corpse. She is sentenced to 49 years in prison. The big difference between what Miss Riddle got and what Mr. Lowe got was she went to a jury trial and she had 12 people deciding her fate. He had me. Do I think that justice was served? Looking back at it, knowing that Michaela got 49 years, I would have liked to have seen life without parole. Michaela will forever have to live with the guilt of taking a young father away from his family for something he didn't even do. She was only involved in this kind of activity because she wanted to hang on to somebody who she thought loved her by doing the things that he wanted to do. Michaela wanted to please Gerald Lowe. You have to be mindful who you surround yourself with. You know, have your own conscience, be able to make decisions on your own. When you recognize that things are not aligned with your values, then sometimes you have to exit stage left. Young ladies just need to know their worth thing. You don't need this dude to manage your life. You can manage your own life. You're intelligent. You're beautiful. You can get out and do your own thing. Once you get past that hurdle and learn to love yourself, you can do anything. You can do anything. If home is where the heart is, what happens when that heart is filled with hate? Before you know it, the darkness can consume you, and your only chance for escape is to burn the home to the ground. After a move to the big city, Young Courtney King is certain her luck is about to change when she rolls the dice on love. She was in love with him, and she was following her heart. But the fire in her soul is quickly snuffed out when her new man okay. rakes her through the cold. That was certainly no accident. Everything she did on that night was at Damien's direction. And in San Diego, California, timid Dorothy Maraglino is as straight-laced as they come. Dorothy was a rule follower. She had a good home. She craved structure. She craved order. But when she meets a man who helps her explore her sexual limits, it thrusts her headfirst into a world of pain. There was a level of violence that went beyond mere fantasy and actually became reality. Dorothy was very possessive. She put Lewis on a pedestal. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Born and raised in the suburbs of Houston, Texas, 17-year-old Courtney King is as low-key as her surroundings. She was pleasant to be around. She was soft-spoken. She had some intelligence to her, but I think she struggled a little bit with her self-esteem. The shy high school junior has never had a serious boyfriend, but finds all the comfort she needs in the welcoming arms of her family. Her father and mother were divorced, but were amicably involved uh, with each other and in support of Courtney. She had two siblings that she was close to and had a lot of love, a lot of support as she grew up. Following graduation, Courtney looks to branch out within the confines of her tiny community. Though when she fails to put down roots, the now 22-year-old kicks around the idea of moving 30 minutes away to big city Houston. Courtney had a job working ticket sales at the soccer stadium, but she had just recently been let go. So Courtney was looking for a fresh start. 
For someone like Courtney, it was a very daunting thing to go from a small city to a big city. This was something that opened her eyes to interact with others, to explore new horizons. Just a month after the move, Courtney's new life is already taking off. She quickly lands a job, and shortly after, bumps into Damien Salinas, a handsome young man two years her senior. Damien was really good looking and sometimes relied on those looks to get what he needed. Although he hasn't been able to charm his way into a job and lives with various family members, Damien's got a million dollar smile. And it doesn't take long for the two to become an item. Courtney didn't know a lot about Damien or his past, but he definitely swept her off her feet. But when she decides to take her new dish back home for dinner after just three months of dating, her family is left with a bitter taste in their mouths. There was a, one instance in which Damien pointed at Courtney and told her to sit down and be quiet. And apparently the family felt that that was uh, indicative of maybe some abusive tendencies in the relationship. Damien very quickly became a wedge between Courtney and her family members. Yeah, I will leave. Come on, Damien. But Courtney's wearing rose-colored glasses, and the pressure from her overbearing family drives her away from them and further into the arms of her lover. Even when he finally comes clean about his record, which includes burglary and property theft. Courtney was so in love, she didn't care about his criminal record. She was willing to do anything for her man. I, I believe she felt like she could change his, uh, uh, his ways and make him a better person. Although the hustler has never been able to hold down steady work, he's always found a way to make ends meet. However, he's not one to talk about his business or his pleasure. Damien did not let Courtney into what he was doing on a daily basis. To a large degree, he did not let her into his life. And there was a good reason for that. He didn't want her to necessarily know that he maybe had this history of trolling for gay men online. Despite his shady ways, Courtney doesn't think twice about showering her new slice with gifts, including a cell phone, so they can stay in touch when they're not together. She didn't do this in order to spy on him or snoop or keep tabs on him. She did this to show him that she could provide him what he couldn't afford himself. As time goes on, Courtney decides to fund the next stage of their journey leasing an apartment on the edge of town and immediately moving her man in. This was really the first time they had a stable home of his own. But it doesn't take long for the financial pressure to take a toll on the relationship. Damien has no motivation to work and finding a sugar daddy online has gotten him nowhere. Still, he wants to contribute to their new digs at any cost. When you're a man who believes in the stereotypical role of being the provider, of being the alpha, and your woman was the sole provider, well, this was a shock to Damien's system. And so he wanted to do anything to be able to get that man card again. So Damien again hits the internet. But on this occasion, he's not just looking for a good time. He wants to become rich. Damien came up with a plan to solicit gay men online, once again falling back on his good looks. He wanted to lure them in and then rob them. In just a few clicks, he spots a romantic ad placed by 51-year-old Juanario Rosas, a registered nurse for a renowned cancer center in Houston. Juanario had uh, uh, recently separated from a long-time relationship, apparently was uh, in a stage in his life where he was uh, just looking for some casual encounters. For the next 24 hours, Damien lures Renario with some sexy texts and emails, and the nurse immediately takes the bait. They exchanged uh, some banter back and forth uh, and eventually uh, agreed to, to a meeting. While Damien finalizes his plans, he makes sure to keep his girlfriend in the dark, as he's done for most of their relationship. Unfortunately, she has no idea what evil acts her man has in store and that she'll be called on to help. Courtney would do anything for her lover. He did his best to put it all on her. Young Courtney King has broken out of her shell after leaving her small Texas town in pursuit of love and adventure in big city Houston. 
but after falling for controlling Damien Salinas, her life is about to take a disturbing turn. Courtney was certain that Damien was the one. She knew that this was the fairy tale guy who would make all of her dreams come true. But little did she know how far she would have to go in order to keep that love that she wanted so badly. While Courtney spends a quiet Friday night at home, her man arranges a phony first date with the intention of robbing Juanario Rosas, a kind-hearted nurse looking for love on the internet. She had gone to bed and Damien had left. She did not know where he'd gone. On a cool early autumn night, Damien drives 20 miles to Winario's upscale home in Pearland, Texas. Winario was really excited that Damien was coming over. He got his house ready, he got condoms. He was preparing for a good night. As the evening begins, the two strike up some awkward chit chat. However, when the libations start to flow, things become more comfortable. He was preparing for a really fun night, but he had no idea what he was in store for. No sooner can Wanario finish unbuttoning his shirt when Damien makes a fist and strikes with menacing intent. I don't know whether Damien set out to hurt, harm, or kill Mr. Rosas, whether this was part of some grand plan, only Damien knows. But Wanario was stronger than he looked. He fought back as hard as he could. As the struggle escalated, Damien grabbed whatever heavy object was nearby and used it to beat Wanario's head in. The moment he grows weak, Damien reaches for a necktie and viciously ties it around his date's neck. Seconds later, Wenario appears to gasp his last breath. This was not how Damien planned for this to go. He was completely caught off guard. He is shaken, he is scared, and he realizes he's gonna need some help. Up until now, Courtney's had no idea what her man had up his sleeve. But shortly after midnight, it becomes disturbingly clear. She was home, uh, asleep, and received a phone call from Damien to come pick him up. The when was now, and the where was Honoria's house. OK, OK. Damien didn't give her a request. Damien told her what to do, and Courtney followed direction. Courtney was at Damien's beck and call. Whatever he needed, whatever he wanted, she gave to him. And this time was no exception. She was going to rush by his side and be there for whatever he needed, and she wasn't going to ask any questions whatsoever. Once she arrives at Wenario's house, she notices several stacks of items on the front porch. Just then, her boyfriend appears from the front door and hastily orders her to start collecting valuables with no explanation about the horror upstairs. Courtney follows her lover's instructions. She begins loading up anything she could find. Though on the ride back to their apartment, he breaks the news about the assault on Wenario. As much as Courtney really adored Damien, she knew that he wasn't always on the up and up. But this time, this was something that was even too big for her belief system. And therefore, it was just easier for her to just give him support. Courtney had an unthinking devotion to Damien, what he wanted and what he needed. And that night was no different. Back home, the couple weighs their options trying frantically to come up with a way to make Damien's misdeeds look like a tragic accident. So they came up with a plan to burn Winario's house down with his body inside. The pair quickly changes and makes their way back to the crime scene. On the way, they stop at a 24-hour grocery store, and Courtney purchases some supplies, namely lighter fluid, as well as paper plates, soda, and charcoal, to avoid suspicion. I think that says a lot about her mindset is that she knew that what she was doing was wrong. When they get back to Winario's, the duo makes their way to the upstairs bedroom, where they find his motionless body covered in blood. Get caught. They collected some clothing uh, and placed it in a pile outside the door of the master bedroom, doused it with the lighter fluid, and uh, ignited it. Just then, as the room goes up in flames, they hear a moan coming from the bed. It's Winario, and he's very much alive dead or not, he wanted to conceal the crime that he had committed. In Fallbrook, California, Dorothy Maraglino also learns that keeping a man on a leash can lead to a whole lot of hurt. Dorothy was very protective of Lewis and very jealous. She had no idea what she was getting herself into.
Just a few hours after robbing and strangling nurse Juanario Rosas, Damian Salinas and his unwitting girlfriend, Courtney King, set a fire at his place to cover their tracks, though they're shocked to see the victim is still alive, making the crime even more malicious. So at this point, a decision had to be made by Courtney. Either she was going to give it up or she was going to follow all the way through with this in order to protect this guy that she loved. And that's exactly what she did. As Winario moans for help, the two make a dash for the front door as flames engulf the bedroom. The fire spread very quickly, went up the walls, into the ceiling, even bursting water pipes. Unfortunately for the suspects, their plans are soon doused. When the pipe busted, it sent water crashing down onto the fire and basically extinguished the fire. Their actions actually uh, preserved the crime scene. He gave Courtney and Damien a couple days before the body was discovered. But two days later, as the murderous couple hides out at their place, Winario's colleagues at the medical center grow concerned. Paraland police were summoned to the victim's home uh, to do a welfare check by some of his co-workers when the victim failed to show up for his shift at work. Immediately after arriving, officers notice an acrid odor seeping from the home. As they enter the unlocked front door and make their way through the house, they quickly discover the source of the smell. When they got upstairs, they found a disturbing crime scene. They saw piles of burnt clothing, bottles of lighter fluid. At this point, they suspected arson. Just then, they spot Wanario's lifeless body on the bed. Whatever happened to him was undoubtedly intentional. Around the victim's body, we located uh, several pieces of uh, a broken wall sconce uh, that we believe was used to strike the victim several times. Uh, he also had a necktie wrapped around his neck. Investigators move swiftly to obtain Wanario's cell phone records and notice several calls and texts from one particular number in the days leading up to his death. It's Courtney King's, though she bought the phone for her boyfriend. Damien's cell phone was in the area of their home until uh, roughly about 8.30, uh, at which point it began tracking back towards Pearland. Uh, it was in the Pearland area for the next several hours. Hoping for some answers, investigators rush to dial in on the phone owner. And five days later, they locate her at the apartment she shares with Damien in Houston. Though before they make it to Courtney's doorstep, her man leaves her high and dry. Some point in time, Damien fled the scene prior to us arriving. Where are you going? Damien showed his true colors. He was a coward, and he wasn't going to be there for Courtney the way that she was there for him. When questioned, Courtney maintains her innocence, claiming she has no idea who Winario is or how her boyfriend is connected to him. Her answers were very generic, very minimal. If you have any information about... But when investigators tell her they're working a homicide case and this is serious, Courtney goes silent, then asks for something unexpected. She requested uh, a piece of paper and a pen, and she scribbled something down, and she had written, if you're asking if he did it, yes. It was pretty evident to me that she was referring to the murder. She just couldn't verbalize the unspeakable horror. She could not be able to put into words what the man she loved had done to this innocent person, to this victim. She could only bleed them out by writing them. Courtney is immediately taken to the PD for further questioning. She's visibly hurt that Damien left her at the mercy of police and decides if she's going down, he's coming with her. She confessed to everything she knew about Damien's crime, her role in it, and the cover-up. Throughout this relationship, it really had felt to Courtney like it was her and this guy against the world. But she realized it wasn't true any longer, that he had thrown her under the bus, he had run out of the place and left her on her own, so now she had to take care of herself. Detectives work feverishly to find their prime suspect. And when they release his information to the public, the wanted criminal turns himself in seven days after Winario's death. Under the interrogation room lights, Damien doesn't think twice about turning the tables on his girlfriend. Damien confessed insofar that he said he contributed to Winario's death, but it was all colored under the ruse that it was Courtney that set up this uh, encounter. Courtney. It was Courtney that initially attacked uh, Winario. 
but police know the truth. The evidence contradicts Damien's story of Courtney being the one to be in contact with Honorio, of Courtney being with Damien the entire time they were with Honorio, as well as the phone messages that strongly indicate are from Damien and not from Courtney. A year after Winario's murder, Damien changes his tune and pleads guilty to felony arson and murder. He's sentenced to 50 years in prison with the possibility of parole. For her role in the crime, Courtney pleads guilty to felony arson and burglary of a habitation and is sentenced to 15 years in prison. She made a choice uh, to do the things that she did, and she's ultimately responsible for them. But everything she did on that night was at Damien's direction. Behind bars, she has shown repentance for her actions, not to mention getting involved with a guy like Damien. She was absolutely remorseful, absolutely regretful. She felt terrible for having been in this relationship, for the effect that it had on her family, and for what happened to Mr. Rosas. I am sure not a day goes by she doesn't think about it and regret it. It was evident that uh, Courtney was, was more in love with Damien than Damien was in love with her. Courtney's dreams of love quickly went up in smoke when she followed her man straight into the fire. In Fallbrook, California, Dorothy Maraglino also finds out that being tied down by a man can land you in a world of hurt. Raised in Fallbrook, California, just 45 minutes north of San Diego, Dorothy Maraglino is a ray of sunshine to her friends and family. Dorothy was a rule follower a good student, she had a good home. She was pretty much an ideal child. Religion played a big role in her life, and there was that sense of devotion, I think, that was instilled in her at a very young age that she uh, continued to practice with respect to her friendships and her relationships. By 18, the sheltered girl has never had a serious boyfriend, but marvels at how her friends snicker about their exploits. Young girls can be very impressionable when they hear their peers talking, especially when it's about experiences that they really haven't engaged in or never perhaps even heard about. So it can become something that's very interesting, very exhilarating, something that's very attractive. Following graduation, Dorothy heads for college and studies up on what men want. After a string of steady relationships, Dorothy lands herself a husband and a house at age 27. But thanks to a lackluster sex life, the three-year marriage is short-lived, and Dorothy is left empty inside. There was a real sense of inadequacy that she felt once that marriage ended, and so she was looking to fulfill that sense of inadequacy through something else. Like most people, she begins by surfing the Internet, looking for like-minded people. And soon, her plain Jane ways become too vanilla even for her. As she got older, as she became a woman, something changed. She became less stellar, and she was left wondering, what is life all about? Is this all there is? After tasting a few dishes, she's ready for a partner whom she can relinquish all control to. Now to be exposed to this sort of new underground was something that really caught her eye, something that intrigued her something that she thought perhaps she might be able to fit into. So it doesn't take long for the now 25-year-old to fall headfirst into the world of BDSM, a group who enjoy their pleasure served with a side of agony. BDSM stands for bondage, discipline, sadism, and masochism. Within this community, there's a sexual element, but it's not all about the sexual encounter. There is this power exchange of the person who likes to inflict pain interacting with the person who likes to receive pain. But the real hurt is just beginning when Dorothy crosses paths with a dominant who promises to make her most twisted dreams come true. Contractually and in terms of their relationship, she promised to serve him without reservation. There was a level of violence that went beyond mere fantasy and actually became reality. <laughs> a 
After dipping her toe in the secret waters of sadistic bondage in Fallbrook, California, submissive Dorothy Maraglino finally feels like the woman she's always fantasized of becoming. It didn't take long for her to jump into the deep end of the pool. Before, she had been very reserved in her personality, crave structure. But when she got into this community of this sexual deviancy, she pretty much went whole hog. And when she meets Luis Perez while scrolling through an online S&M chat room, her world is turned completely upside down. Lewis is a 45-year-old staff sergeant in the Marines. He was married at the time, living with his wife. However, he also had a secret life. What that secret life was, was he practiced the BDSM lifestyle. After exchanging a few messages, Dorothy is instantly smitten and hopes to get to know him more intimately, even though he's still wearing his ring. She knew he had a wife. Apparently, the relationship was strained, so it didn't seem to be a source of contention. After a few weeks of exploring their limitations in person, they enter into a contractual relationship, promising to fulfill their darkest desires. He was referred to as Master Ivan, indicating his relationship to Dorothy, who is also known as Dee. A few nights a week, Lewis would go to Dorothy's house. And when he went there, they would engage in play. This play involves spiked gloves called vampire gloves, knives, needles, whips, anything and everything to inflict pain. But after just one year, Dorothy decides to take a different kind of risk by opening her home to not just Lewis, but other members of her underground community. It included other master-slave relationships people who are allowed to come into her house and live in her house. It might be another couple, for example, another male-female couple who lived there and participated in various types of activities. Five years into their relationship, Dorothy is happy as can be, even though her partner is still living with his wife. Though deep down, she longs for a slave of her own. And when she approaches her master, he's quick to sign off. She put out a personal ad very similar to the one she had responded to years before with Lewis. And when unemployed 24-year-old Jessica Lopez answers the call, their world changes forever. When Jessica came across that ad, she was intrigued, and they set up a date to meet. After some chit-chat, Dorothy agrees that Jessica is a perfect fit for their unorthodox lifestyle, as long as she agrees to the terms they decide on. Dorothy would be submissive to Lewis when he was present in the household. But when he wasn't, which was quite frequently because he was married, Dorothy was the one who ran that household. Jessica was the perfect fit in this hierarchy. She was only eager to please and eager to serve. Though according to the contract, her job is to strictly serve Dorothy, not Lewis while living out her wildest fantasies. There was cutting. There was tasting of blood. All of these things, there was needle play in which blood was drawn, and they would taste the blood. There were no limits. And the thing they enjoy most is writing letters to one another, detailing their most sadistic requests. She and Jessica began to write detailed letters fantasizing about kidnapping women. When someone has been leading a life where they've had no excitement, that's just simply just black and white, there's no longer any color for them, then they will tend to go in the opposite direction to find something that can make them feel alive again. But all good things must come to an end. When six months into the trio's arrangement, Dorothy finds out she's pregnant with Lewis's child. She no longer hosted these large BDSM parties. She took down her sex dungeon that she had inside her home. And it was at that time that both her and Lewis were looking forward to raising a child together. Unfortunately, Dorothy still has a contractual obligation to keep her master satisfied. She knows Lewis has a taste for instilling fear in his submissives. So she pens to Jessica her most macabre letter yet hoping she'll help give him the ultimate gift. To compensate for the fact that Dorothy could not engage in a lot of the S&M play that she had been engaging in, 
these letters evolved into a place so dark, they started talking about how to get rid of their victims after they used them. Unfortunately, putting pen to paper is no longer cutting it. She decides that the only way to keep her master satisfied is to make their words come to life and tell Lewis they're going to kidnap a new slave. This was a role play. It was enjoyable. It was adult consent. People weren't really getting hurt. But now, introducing this idea of actually kidnapping someone against their will, now that took it to the next level. The trio's first step is choosing a victim. So they make a list composed of acquaintances both in and outside of the BDSM community. But Dorothy soon realizes they've already befriended the perfect target. 22-year-old knockout, Brittany Kilgore. Brittany was married to a Marine. She was living in the area while her husband was deployed to Afghanistan. Brittany was not a participant in the BDSM lifestyle. And so her interactions with both Dorothy and Jessica were more of the normal interactions that there would be between neighbors. The mistress and slave immediately set up a coffee date to catch up with their potential prey. And when Brittany confides in them that she's divorcing her husband and planning to leave town while he's deployed, it seals the deal. She was vulnerable. She was alone. It was the perfect storm for taking advantage of her. With Brittany in their crosshairs, Dorothy is ready to make good on her pledge, to keep Lewis happy at any cost. She was the perfect slave. She was the perfect patsy. Dorothy became consumed with this need to please her man. <laughs> In Fallbrook, California, Dorothy Maraglino has enlisted her slave, Jessica Lopez, to help kidnap an unwitting victim to please her master, Luis Perez. As far as this BDSM community, they knew that Luis, Jessica, and Dorothy were perhaps really to the extreme. But what they hadn't realized was that these individuals wanted to take it to a place that perhaps they could not come back. After meeting a friend, Brittany Kilgore, for coffee, they decide she'd be the perfect sacrifice. And when the women return home and tell Lewis about their recent interaction, he couldn't be more excited by the idea of having Brittany on the chopping block. Lewis was very attracted to Brittany. She was young, she was good looking. Lewis liked the idea of inflicting this kind of pain and making this young woman a victim, so he bought into Dorothy's plan. On a sunny April morning, Brittany is at her place, packing to move back home to Pennsylvania. Just then, she hears an unexpected knock on the door. It's her friend, Louis, and he's bummed because he has two tickets to a dinner cruise, and Dorothy's too ill from her pregnancy to make it. When Brittany balks at the invitation, Louis gives her the phone and tells her to contact Dorothy directly. Dorothy says, yeah, go ahead and go, and gives her permission to go on the dinner cruise. However, no tickets were ever purchased, she reluctantly agrees, and that night, Lewis picks her up, dressed to the nines. But just minutes down the road, he mentions there's been a change of plans. He says, oh, the cruise is gone. It left the dock. We missed it. But I have a magazine back at home that has plenty of ideas for the evening. Let's go back to the house and figure out some evening plans. Brittany says okay, but deep down, she senses there's trouble brewing and frantically starts texting her roommate. The first text message that really caused Brittany's friend to be concerned about her safety was a message that simply read, help. Before her pal can respond, Lewis spins the SUV into Dorothy's driveway, though his two partners in crime are at the grocery store, unsure when Lewis would be bringing Brittany home. Just then, without warning, Lewis pulls out a stun baton he'd hidden under the driver's seat and sends 80,000 volts into Brittany's neck. As Brittany lay incapacitated, her phone begins to vibrate, forcing her attacker to think fast. Lewis responded on Brittany's phone. He sent text messages to her friends that said, everything's okay, I'm fine. Having bought himself some time, Lewis grabs his victim and drags her inside. Brittany comes too, as Dorothy and her sub return from the store. 
She moans and pleads for her life when she sees the women, but it only arouses the slave master more. Dorothy could see that this turned Lewis on, and she was pleased that once again, she was an instrument of some pleasure for her man. For the next three hours, the trio uses handcuffs, wires, knives, and gags to torture their victim, getting off on her pain. When they feel she's had enough, the group ends Brittany's suffering once and for all. They put something around her neck, applied such force to the neck that it broke her voice box inside and ultimately killed her by strangulation. Exhausted from the brutal attack, the lovers feverishly form a plan to get rid of Brittany's body. They put her in a tarp, then they drove around Riverside County looking for a spot to dump the body. They drove near a large lake, and then they dumped her body by the side of the road. With the deed done, the group callously returns to business as usual. It's hard to know exactly what was going through their minds after they murdered Brittany, but what they did was they went back home, they cleaned up the mess, and the next morning, they went back to life as if nothing had happened. Little do they know, Brittany's roommate, who received the suspicious texts, has contacted police to report her missing after she never came home the night before. And she knows Lewis is responsible. What Lewis didn't know is that Brittany's friend had been in a back bedroom when he came over to invite her on the dinner cruise. She heard almost everything, and what she could tell police was that the last time she saw Brittany, she had left with Lewis. When push comes to shove, will Dorothy stand by her man or her woman? Ties will be put to the test as police close in on the tight-knit trio of paramours. Dorothy was very possessive and uh, created great friction between them. She would do anything for her lover, even take the blame herself. After murdering Brittany Kilgore and dumping her body along a rural Fallbrook, California roadside, lovers Dorothy Maraglino, Luis Perez, and Jessica Lopez think they're in the clear. I don't know what they thought it might accomplish. Perhaps the ultimate sexual satisfaction for the trio. But in reality, where was this going to go? Unfortunately, the walls start closing in after Brittany's roommate calls police to report her missing, just 12 hours after she disappeared for a date with the slave master himself. The next morning, the deputy showed up to investigate the missing person report. He learned that the last person to be with Brittany was Lewis. So he called Lewis on the phone and told Lewis to show up at the apartment complex. When questioned, Lewis admits he went out with Brittany last night, but swears he dropped her off and never heard from her again. Lewis's story was that he drove from Fallbrook all the way to downtown San Diego to go on this harbor cruise, which they missed, but instead ended up being in the vicinity of a nightclub, which Brittany actually went into, and he did not. Detectives are leery of Lewis's account and ask if they can look inside his SUV. Hoping his cooperation will hide his involvement, the slave master foolishly agrees, and investigators are shocked by what they find inside. They found a stun baton. It's quickly sent to the lab for processing, while Lewis is taken to the PD for further questioning. He is arrested on an illegal weapons charge, giving police time to build their case. He was not helpful to the investigation at that point. Fortunately, not everyone is so tight-lipped. When police ask the media for additional information, they get the spark they've been looking for from an unlikely source. Just 24 hours after Brittany disappeared, word spread like wildfire in the BDSM community about this case and people started coming forward to the police. They started talking about how Dorothy and Lewis had this fantasy, this obsession about kidnapping people. To see if the rumors are true, investigators head over to Dorothy's house to speak with Mistress D. Unfortunately, their gags are firmly in place as Dorothy stands by her woman and turns on her man. She told Jessica to follow her lead and when the police arrived, they denied any involvement with Brittany, and they denied any knowledge of Lewis's date with Brittany. 
Detectives don't have enough to hold the women just yet, so they can only return to the station. Meanwhile, the pair is certain police are onto them and immediately plan an exit strategy. Dorothy and Jessica went to a hotel room in an area called Point Loma in San Diego, and Dorothy was preparing to leave the state. Before she heads out, Dorothy tells Jessica how scared she is of losing custody of her and Lewis's child once it's born. The next morning, she takes her flight and goes to the East Coast, leaving Jessica, the slave, behind in the uh, hotel room that they were staying in. Jessica can't deal with seeing her master in distress and says she'll do anything to help. So she pens a letter to authorities, taking full blame for Brittany's disappearance. After signing the document, she pulls a knife from her suitcase and slashes her wrists, but not before dialing 911. She was ecstatic that she could give Dorothy something that no one else could, which was the ultimate sacrifice, giving her life so that Dorothy could have freedom. When the detectives enter the hotel room, they see not only the bloody body of Jessica, but there's a note in that seven-page letter was a chilling, detailed account of the murder and torture of Brittany, as well as specific location where the body was. In the letter, Jessica claims Lewis and Dorothy are completely innocent. She was extremely loyal, extremely obedient, she made it very clear that in her mind, Dorothy was the perfect mistress, and she did not want to lose that affection. But police know she couldn't have acted alone. And after rushing Jessica to the hospital and placing her under arrest, they focused their attention on finding Dorothy. A month later, the cunning mistress returns to a different San Diego hotel room, only to find investigators have been tracking her every move through cell phone pings and credit card transactions. The police have her under surveillance. They go to the hotel where she's at. They place her under arrest for murder. Even though Jessica tried to take the fall, the trio is charged with conspiracy to kidnap, kidnapping, murder, torture, and attempted sexual battery of Brittany. They each maintain their innocence, including Jessica, who now claims she was forced to write the telling letter by her mistress and place their fates in the hands of a panel of peers. And the jury convicted all three defendants of all charges with the exception of Jessica. She was not convicted of the crime of conspiracy. For their heinous crime, the three are given life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the end, Dorothy and Lewis remain loyal to each other and show no remorse for their deplorable actions. This is just a tragic, tragic case uh, that involves people who are lonely, people who are seeking fulfillment in some very dark places. You add violence in there, you add sex, you add insecurities, and it's a perfect recipe for tragedy. We'll probably never know why this happened and what- Teenage love is in full bloom in Yale, Michigan, but not everyone's happy for Tia Skinner and her new boyfriend. He was a bad guy with a bad reputation. Tia's parents forbid her from seeing him. But she's willing to take drastic measures to keep her new man in her life. What she orchestrated was just horrific. I don't know how anyone could come up with something like this. She saw her parents as an obstacle and she wasn't going to let them get in the way of her and her boyfriend. And later, in a suburb of Detroit, love-starved Renata Hamilton falls hard for a self-described bad boy. She was in love with a hardened criminal. No good could come of this. And when Renata is pulled into his life of crime, it costs her more than she could ever imagine. She did this to prove her loyalty to him in hopes that he would never leave her. And it was her wanting to please her man. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the US. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. In the small town of Yale, Michigan, Tia Skinner has finally found a home after being bounced from house to house. By the age of three, Tia was taken in by her in uncle Merritt and Paul Skinner. This is for you. She had three older siblings, two brothers, and one sister who were about five to six years older than her. Tia's older brother, Jeffrey, was her half-brother. They shared the same mother. 
and Paul and Mara adopted him a few years before Tia was born. Her other two older siblings, Aaron and Madeline, they were Paul and Mara's children. What color night light would you like? Being adopted by family, what's called the kinship home, certainly gives a child a much better advantage with regard to fitting into uh, a family. For Tia, this was advantageous for her because it helped her have a quicker adjustment and it helped her as far as being a more successful adult. And her new beginning with the Skinner family is a testament to how far she's come. Tia was born in a state penitentiary. Her mother was a drug addict. After Tia was born, she was taken by her biological father, who had her for a short amount of time. She did have a good relationship with her biological father, up until she was about eight years old when he passed away. Over the next 14 years, the family showers Tia with love, giving her everything she needs and more. The Skinners were a very active family. They went on ski trips, camping trips. They loved to hang out together and have fun together and travel together. They were just a fun, loving family. With their support, Tia thrives. She was an honor student. She was well-liked. She was very involved. She played basketball. She was in the band. She played volleyball. And her family, they were her biggest cheerleaders. By her senior year of high school, all of her siblings are away at college. And 17-year-old Tia is left alone with her parents. Paul had a job as a pipe fitter, and he was out of state quite a bit. He was home on weekends. Mara was in the school system as a teacher. With Paul gone most days, she's under Mara's wing 24-7. Tia and Mara had a pretty, pretty regular schedule. Uh, Tia would make coffee for Mara in the morning. They'd ride to school together. After school, she would be dropped off to babysit, unless she had after-school activities. So they had a pretty steady and regular routine. As perfect as things may seem, there's still one crack in the family picture as Tia begins to blossom into a young woman. You're supposed to be doing your homework. The Skinner family, they never really had any major points of contention with Tia, but they did have issues with the boys that she chose to date, and it really started to become a problem for the family. I would just ask my friend Ashley for help. Okay, just stay focused. Her parents felt that the guys that she was choosing weren't worthy of dating her. They were dropping out of school, they were hanging out with the wrong crowd, they were into drugs, and so that became a, a, a very big struggle for her parents. Tia appears to have gone for the bad boys because that's what she knew. No matter how bad her dad was, she loved him for that and so overlooked a lot of his very bad habits. She did the same thing with the bad boys. But their faith in God always keeps the family centered, even through her trying teenage years. The Skinners were a church-going family. Tia was involved in a youth group, and they went to church regularly. Every Wednesday night, she attends Bible study. And on one fall evening, she runs into 18-year-old Jonathan Kurtz, an old crush that will change her life forever. Tia actually knew Jonathan from high school. He was a year older than her, and he dropped out of high school and moved away for a while. And they reconnected when he came back, and she met him again at her church youth group. Those few hours together bring back old feelings. And the next day, Jonathan asks Tia to be his girlfriend. She happily accepts, but when she tells her mother, Mara isn't nearly as excited. And I think he really likes me. I really like him, too. Who is it? Jonathan Kurtz? Tia's mother knew most of the kids in the neighborhood, but she wasn't quite sure she was familiar with Jonathan. The name rings a bell, but I hope it's not the guy I'm thinking of. And what Mara recalls from teaching him in middle school convinces her she doesn't want Jonathan around her daughter. He was known for being involved with drugs, and at some point, he was hospitalized for mental issues. Tia assures her that Jonathan has changed, and she begs her mom to give him a chance. You don't trust me with anything! I never trust me! No, that's not true. I... But Mara's mind is already made up. She wanted Tia to stop seeing him, and so she immediately objected to any continuation of the relationship. When Tia's father comes home from work that weekend, he sides with Mara. But Jonathan's rebel ways are already rubbing off. Despite her parents' orders, she keeps seeing him anyway. Their relationship pretty much had to be kept in secret. They had to sneak and text each other 
they would meet at youth group, but there wasn't a lot of time that they had to actually spend together one-on-one. -on -one. What we typically see in young love is, in this particular case, a young woman meets a guy who makes her feel really special, and therefore, because he is the first one, he's setting the template. She goes for him, hook, line, and sinker. But her backdoor defiance is quickly found out. Mara drove past the park, and she happened to see Tia with Jonathan. They were just sitting there talking, but she was surprised. She didn't expect to see them together. Embarrassed, Tia leaves Jonathan behind and jumps in the car with a disappointed Mara. And what Mara has to say goes in one ear and out the other. Jonathan sent Tia a text message that said he loved her, and Tia responded and said she loved him too. She decided to take her cell phone away and put her on punishment and said that she was no longer allowed to date Jonathan. Mara thinks she's made her point. What she doesn't know is that she's incited a burning rage inside Tia. Tia was young and impressionable, and Jonathan came along and offered her something that she felt that she didn't have at home, the excitement, uh, taking a walk on the wild side. And so she was completely open to that experience, even though it turned out to be a very negative one. Two weeks into her relationship with Jonathan, Tia proposes a wicked plan. Tia and Jonathan were texting, and she mentioned that she wished they were dead. Tia was so consumed with this relationship and appeared to be so immature that she didn't realize the power of her words. Jonathan offered to kill her parents. Tia didn't think twice. She thought it would be better for both of them if her parents were dead. She saw this as a chance to be free. Her and Jonathan could be together all they wanted. To sweeten the pot for her new boyfriend, the 17-year-old decides to turn some funds she received from a recent academic scholarship from book money to blood money. She offered Jonathan $1,000 to kill her parents. Now that the plan is in play, Tia and Jonathan start the countdown to their independence. For Tia, just to be detached from her parents in that way, having no feelings for them, uh, not even seeing them as human beings, was so quick, was so rapid. But at the end of that tunnel for her was her freedom, the freedom to be with Jonathan. Nothing was going to stand in the way of their love, not even family. In the small town of Yale, Michigan, 17-year-old Tia Skinner has fallen in love with 18-year-old bad boy Jonathan Kurtz. Her parents have forbidden her from seeing him but no one's going to keep Tia from her new man. Jonathan Kurtz was not a stable man. He'd been in and out of mental facilities and had a history with drugs. Tia and Jonathan had been together about two weeks, but she was convinced he was worth fighting for. The passion in Tia's relationship with Jonathan was very deep. She was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice in order for the two of them to be together for what she thought would be forever. And when she suggests that they kill her parents, Jonathan jumps at the chance to prove himself to her. But he realizes he needs a little help. Jonathan wanted to recruit his neighbor, James Preston, who had gone to high school with both he and Tia. Jonathan approached James and said he was going to get $1,000 and that he split it with him. And 18-year-old James Preston jumps on board. James might have gotten involved for financial opportunity. After all, he was going to get half of the murder fee and had a child to take care of and needed the money. Now that the killers are hired, Tia wants the job done as soon as possible so she and Jonathan can be together forever. Tia explained exactly how this is going to work. She drew a map of her house, how they would get in through her window so that they knew exactly how to get to, from her room to the parents' bedroom. It was going to look like a break-in and Tia was going to be downstairs in the basement watching a movie so that it would seem as if she didn't know or didn't hear what was going on. This plan that Tia came up with was so well thought out, so complex, it really makes you wonder whether she had thought of this plan before, whether she had been working on this, perhaps because her parents kept her from being with someone else in the past. 
And 10 days into her relationship with Jonathan, the date for the murder is set. Tia told James and Jonathan that, that next Friday when her father returned from his out of town job, that is when she wanted the killing done. The following Thursday, a day before the planned murders, Tia plays the role of dutiful daughter. She still fixed Mars coffee. They rode to school together. They followed the regular routine. It was just a normal day. But that Thursday afternoon, a day before they planned to carry out the murders, an unexpected arrival throws a wrench in their plans. When Tia got home from school that day, she found out that her dad came home early. She sent a quick text to Jonathan telling him that they should do the murder tonight, and it should be done at 11 o'clock. This will be the end to Tia's troubles and she and Jonathan can be free to pursue their love without interference. She has officially put the nail in her parents' coffin. No, we're not doing this tomorrow. We're doing this tonight. Jonathan and James will be ready. And while her murder squad watches the seconds tick off the clock, Tia spends some final hours with Paul and Mara. Tia and her parents had a normal evening. They went shopping together, they went out to dinner, and they came back home. But when they return home from dinner, Tia's thrown off when greeted by her brother, Jeffrey, who's making an unexpected visit. But she knows it's too late to call off the boys. He and his parents were in the kitchen talking, and Tia took this opportunity to sneak upstairs. When Tia stepped into that house and saw Jeffrey, this was a sign that this plan wasn't going to go smooth as she wanted it to. In many ways, it brought her back to her own reality to the possible guilt that she would be having to deal with that she murdered her parents, but also murdered the parents of her siblings too. But the plan is still on. She anxiously awaits the arrival of Jonathan and James. At around 11 o'clock, Tia's parents had gone to bed. Jeffrey was in the living room and Tia was at her bedroom window waiting on the boys. At 11.05, Jonathan and James jump the fence and run over to Tia's bedroom window where she lets them in. They had bandanas to cover their faces. They had stolen James' father's hunting knives. They came prepared. Tia has a chance to save her family, but she only chooses to spare her brother Jeffrey's life. Well, you better get rid of him, too, or we're going to have to kill him. Just give me five minutes before you go to my parents' She told them that her brother Jeffrey was downstairs. And Jonathan made it very clear to her that if he wasn't in the basement, he was going to kill her brother. So she decides to lure him into the basement by telling her brother that she wants to watch a movie. It's quite possible that Tia spared Jeffrey's life because, after all, that was her sibling. But also in her mind, um, he had never crossed her. By 11.30 PM, everyone is in place. Tia is in the basement with brother Jeffrey. Jonathan and James are upstairs creeping up on Paul and Mara. They went into the bedroom where Mara and Paul were sleeping and started stabbing them. She heard their blood curdling cries and was completely unmoved by it. And later, in the Detroit suburbs, Renata Hamilton's first shot at love may be her last taste of freedom. She had no regard for that man's life. She fed him straight to the devil. Seventeen-year-old Tia Skinner and her 18-year-old boyfriend, Jonathan Kurtz, have decided to murder her parents. While the Skinners sleep, Jonathan and his neighbor, James Preston, execute the horrifying plan. Jonathan and James walked into that pitch black room and Jonathan began to stab Mara and James began to stab Paul. Despite the surprise attack, Paul manages to fight back. Paul eventually got James into a chokehold, but he didn't have enough strength to hold him. So he got up and tried to chase them. Tia heard blood curdling cries from her parents. They were both yelling for help. Jeffrey bolts up the basement stairs, and when he reaches the top, he follows a trail of blood to the front door and watches as his father stumbles back inside. His father really didn't think he was going to make it, so he demanded that he go upstairs and try and save his mother instead. 
In the master bedroom, Mara's been stabbed 26 times, but she's able to grab her phone and call 911. Mara, just hang in there, it's okay. I'm gonna check on that. Jeffrey's torn between which parent to help. Assessing that Mara's in better shape, he runs back downstairs in a last ditch effort to save his father. Jeffrey called for Tia's help, but she never came upstairs to help. Tia was downstairs as cool as a cucumber. Tia! Tia, help! It appears that Tia was so emotionally distant, so disconnected from her parents, that even though she heard their screams and their cries, that she was able to sit there passionless and just allow this crime to continue. Her brother was in fight or flight mode, so Tia's action really went unnoticed. 20 minutes after the attack, paramedics arrive. Cradled in Jeffrey's arms, Paul takes his last breath. And a severely wounded Mara is rushed to the hospital for emergency surgery for excessive stab wounds. Yale County police question Jeffrey and Tia, hoping to get some answers on the night's tragic events. A first responder approached Tia while she was outside and informed her that her father had passed away and that her mother had been rushed to the hospital. And she showed no signs of emotion. She did respond by saying she wanted to go back in the house to retrieve her cell phone. Do you mind if I run and grab my cell phone? It's really remarkable that she remained so calm during this situation. But the reality is, that her actions caused a severe rift in time and destiny for her parents, for her family, and certainly for her siblings. Her lack of emotion is suspicious, and investigators are even more convinced she's involved when they find a telltale piece of evidence. Police searching the grounds outside the privacy fence found the hand-drawn map that Tia had drawn with the crooked words printed, my house. When confronted with the map, she confesses, but isn't completely honest. I swear it. She eventually gave up James and Jonathan's names, and she admitted her involvement in the planning to kill her parents. But she said she called it off, and they did it without her. So essentially, she turned on her boyfriend. Tia was just resolute in saving her own skin. So she did what she thought she had to do, even if it meant turning on the guy that she did this all for. Tia is arrested and taken into custody. Jonathan and James are arrested the following morning at their homes, 20 minutes down the road. Less than a year later, Tia Skinner, Jonathan Kurtz, and James Preston are tried together as co-conspirators in the murder and attempted murder of Paul and Mara Skinner. When the trio went to court, they took opposing positions. James and Jonathan tried to blame Tia. Uh, the whole thing was her idea. Tia, on the other hand, put the blame on James and Jonathan. Miraculously, Mara Skinner makes a full recovery and testifies against her daughter in court. All three are found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. Being 17, 18 years old, and to come to the realization that now you are going to have to spend the rest of your natural life in prison. Now you're going to have to pay the price. You're going to have to pay for the crime by doing that time. Your life is over. The Skinners stand against Tia and make statements during sentencing. The family doesn't have a relationship with Tia, nor do they have the desire to have a relationship with Tia. It's almost as if they feel like the night that they lost Paul, they also lost Tia. After sentencing, Tia never sees Jonathan again. Tia has not offered an explanation for why she did what she did, although she has apologized to the family and written family members' individual letters of apology. Now that Tia has the time to sit in prison and look back at her life, she can't help but think, what she gave up, that she had loving parents, that she had a loving family, and that she threw it all away trying to pursue the young love. Tia Skinner sacrificed her father's life for a boy she'd known for only two weeks. Some 40 miles south, in Detroit, Michigan, 
Rinata Hamilton shared a willingness to make someone else pay the price to keep the love of her man. But her journey seems to start off on the right track. Rinata grew up in Detroit suburbs. She lived in middle-class neighborhoods. There wasn't a lot of violence. There weren't bad communities. She had a pretty decent home life. There was no abuse in the home, and it was a loving family. She had close family ties. By the age of 20, Rinata's days are booked down to the minute. Rinata was working at a fast food restaurant, taking on as many shifts as she could, as well as she was attending college. She was in the accounting program at Baker College studying business. She was in a cycle in her life where most of her time was taken up by school and by work. And nothing slows down her go-getter spirit. She's willing to make great sacrifice to push through the stress of her work-college balance. She was staying with her cousin in Clinton Township and his friend, Brian, which was a one room, a one bedroom apartment. And she was willing to sleep on the floor just so she could be close to school and close to work. Renata was a worker bee. This is a young woman who worked her tail off at school, who worked as much as possible uh, in order to make money and to survive. When she gave, she gave her all. But all work and no play proves to be a lonely way to spend her 20s. And Renata gets tired of going it alone. Yeah, she was a hopeless romantic. She loved the classic romantic movies. And she kind of longed, I think, for that sort of a relationship, uh, someone to be that knight in shining armor. But the man who is going to sweep her off her feet is a far cry from the Romeo she desires. She was headed somewhere, and she allowed him to pull her into his dark little world. And Renata Hamilton throws it all away for approval from her man. Only her desire to be in that relationship would have had her make such a poor decision. 20-year-old Renata Hamilton works part-time and is on track to graduate college in a Detroit suburb, but she's distracted by her desire to find a man. The fact that she had never really had a serious relationship kind of fueled her desire to have a man in her life. That's why she rushes in with the first man that catches her eye. And despite his unemployment, 21-year-old Larry Stewart's dazzling smile captivates a love-crazed Renata. Renata was hanging out with some of her friends, and they introduced her to Larry Stewart. Nice Renata was initially attracted to Larry because he was thin and toned, and Renata was kind of on the heavy set side, so her ideal man was exactly the opposite. Larry knows a good girl when he sees one, so he wastes no time getting her number. Renata may like Larry's swagger, but it's no act. And Renata learns she's bitten off a little more than she can chew. Larry was a criminal. His criminal history included domestic violence, obstructing police, marijuana possession, and assault with a dangerous weapon. Not the kind of guy you want to take home to mom and dad. For Larry to have such a lengthy criminal history by the age of 21, you have to look back to his upbringing probably was very dysfunctional, probably didn't have many opportunities, but certainly this was a person who didn't make the right choices because possibly the choices weren't really there for him. But when her friends tell her about Larry's past, she decides to take her chances and give him a shot. She was just happy to have someone to love and, and be loved by. With her new bad boy around, Renata breaks out of her shell and starts to live a little. Larry was able to take her out of that humdrum study work existence. He didn't have much money because he wasn't working, but he was a warm body, someone who showed her affection, and that was very important to her. Larry started coming over to the apartment almost every day and sleeping over. Even though she shares the apartment with cousin Justin and roommate Brian, Renata and Larry make a space for themselves together on the living room floor most nights. And she showers him with love every chance she gets. 
she had been spending what little money she had on Larry, making sure that he was fed, buying him gifts. She was doing everything she could to maintain that relationship. It's quite possible that living the existence she had, where it was really all work and all study and sleeping on a living room floor, Larry brought her love and that was probably the only bright spot in her life at that point. Five months into the relationship, Larry drops a bombshell when he tells Renata he owes $250 to a loan shark. Without a job, he doesn't have the money to pay it back. What's more, if he doesn't pay up soon, his life may be in danger. Larry wasn't shy to ask people to help him. He was getting in over his head. He was trying to find ways to get money without really having to work. She jumps into action, trying to clear Larry of his debt. So Rinata paid $100 of Larry's debt to this bad guy. She was in love with somebody who didn't have her best interest at heart. She was in love with somebody who was going to do what he wanted and use anybody in his path to help him. For Rinata to give $100 to Larry to pay off the guy that he owed, some people would say, well, what's the big deal? That's not a lot of money. But for Rinata, who was barely making it by financially, it was a major sacrifice, but one she gladly made because she loved Larry. Despite Rinata's generosity, Larry's still concerned for his life. And she can't imagine life without him, so she's willing to help him any way she can. Right, so you remember the money you gave? Larry proposed robbing someone. Rinata bought into this plan. She really wanted to try to save Larry. Are you with me? Most couples at that stage of relationship begin to commit to one another. Renata and Larry decided to commit a crime. Just outside Detroit, Michigan, 20-year-old Renata Hamilton has fallen in love with 21-year-old Larry Stewart. And now she's willing to do anything to save her man's life from a loan shark. Larry owed money, and Renata had only been able to pay $100 of it. Larry suggested to Renata that they plan to rob people so he could get money. Are you with me? Blinded by love, she joins forces with her criminal boyfriend to come up with the perfect robbery. One thing that's very clear about Renata was she was dedicated and she was a worker bee. So when this plan came up by Larry, to rob someone, she gave that her all. No matter how dangerous, she was willing to make it work. And on her way to work, a few days later, Renata runs into 21-year-old Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown was infatuated with uh, Renata. Kevin worked at a local factory, and when he got off work, he typically went through the drive through and saw Renata's face, he flirted with her a lot. As usual, she keeps Kevin hanging for the chance at a real date. It truly is ironic that Renata, someone who really cherished love and wanted that in her life, would take someone like Kevin for granted. She disregarded him, treated him as if he was less than nothing. And despite the continued rejection, Kevin hopes for a change of heart though Renata's heart is in Larry's hands. Renata was at home with Larry and mentioned to him that she had spoken to Kevin Brown. Larry knew about Kevin Brown. He had seen him driving a nice car, flashing wads of money, and that gave Larry his bright idea. Kevin would cash his paychecks and keep the wad in his pocket. Larry thought that there would be hundreds, if not a thousand dollars in his pocket. Larry believes Kevin's an easy target, but he'll need Renata's help in order to reel him in. How you do that? The plan was for Renata to set Kevin up by telling him to pick her up for a date. When he came to pick her up, Larry would be hiding in the hallway and would jump out and rob him. She puts the plan in motion and reaches out to Kevin with a private invitation to her apartment. Uh, you can pick me up at my house Monday morning, okay? 
it's down, it's down. For the first time in her life, Renata got what she always wanted, the love of a man. And at this point, she was willing to do anything in order to keep that relationship, even if it meant putting the life of another man on the line. The following Monday, Renata awaits Kevin's arrival for their much anticipated date. She called Kevin to give him directions to the apartment, but they ended up staying on the phone the entire time. But she was also on the phone through call waiting with Larry. Larry waits in the hallway outside Renata's door. She was able to verify the type of car that Kevin was in, what Kevin was wearing. And she, of course, relayed that information to Larry so he knew who to look out for. He's driving a Lexus truck and he had on flat on. Kevin got out of the car and walked into the apartment building. Renata was listening by the door inside her apartment. An anxious Kevin makes his way to her apartment. Before Kevin could knock on Renata's front door, Larry came rushing at him with the gun out in hand pointed at him. To Larry. surprise this is not going to be easy Kevin Brown is ready for a fight Kevin Brown in fact grabbed the gun in Larry Stewart's hand and the two of them began to struggle Renata watches the fight through the peephole that's when the shots ring out immediately after the struggle started two rounds were fired one of the bullets went right through the front door of Renata's apartment, a shot went off. Oh my God, Larry. Then a second shot went off. That one pierced the door and struck Renata in the stomach. As Renata Hamilton watches through the peephole of her apartment door in Detroit, Michigan, her boyfriend, Larry Stewart, attempts to rob Kevin Brown. That's when two gunshots ring out. The two rounds that were fired, one not only went through Kevin Brown, it went through the wall and struck Renata Hamilton. Renata looked down at her stomach and realized she'd been shot. Her cousin Justin heard the gunshots and rushed out of the bedroom. He saw that she'd been shot and told her to go to the bathroom to clean up. In the hall, in spite of his gunshot wounds, Kevin is fighting for his life. He wrestles Larry for control of the gun. Kevin and Larry wound up tumbling down the stairs towards the front door. In the course of the fighting, Kevin was shot, but he still had strength enough to gain control of the gun. And he chased Larry away. A severely wounded Kevin collapses on the sidewalk. So during the course of this whole gunfight, Larry was actually shot once in the bicep. Kevin was shot four times, twice in the chest, once in the back, and once in the leg. Back upstairs, Renata's too afraid to step outside. Instead, she calls Larry to make sure he's okay. Larry? Larry answered the phone, and Renata told him that she'd been Hello? shot. I need you right now, I've been shot. Girl, I was shot too. He told her that he'd been shot too and to call 911. Then he hung up. When Clinton Township police arrive to the scene, they discover Kevin laying on the sidewalk, clinging to life. Kevin never told him what happened. Kevin's concern was so great for his life. All he could focus on was repeatedly asking for an ambulance. As Kevin's rushed to the hospital, police become aware that a second victim from the apartment is being transported to the emergency room. At that time, they thought that she was just the victim of a stray bullet. 
Now that police are aware that the two victims know each other, they hope Renata can provide more information on what was behind the shooting. She told them that that was her date and that he was on his way to pick her up. But they are held off on further questioning until both victims are treated. In the ER, Renata and Kevin are placed in adjoining rooms, separated by a curtain. Luckily for her, she was only grazed, and the wound looks worse than it is. But Kevin is not so fortunate. Kevin succumbed to his injuries. When Renata found out that Kevin had died, her reaction was cold and emotionless. All she said was, oh no. It's sad to think that what Kevin saw as an opportunity to finally be with Renata, to find some love, actually ended up in his demise. While Renata is in the hospital, her roommate Brian starts talking to detectives. Brian told the police that he had seen Renata and Larry with a gun just the night before. Police realize that Renata's covering for her boyfriend. They head back to her hospital room where she's discharged and they take her down to the police station. Who's Larry Stewart? Feeling cornered, Renata gives up her loyalty to Larry to save her own skin. Renata told police that it was just supposed to be a robbery and that no one was supposed to get hurt, and that her role was simply to lure Kevin to that apartment building. She's placed under arrest for the murder of Kevin Brown. Meanwhile, Larry is on the run. He is moving from house to house, attempting to evade capture. Once the police knew Larry Stewart was involved, they got a photograph. The media was called. His picture was placed on all the newscasts. Nobody knew where he was. The police continued to work every tip that came in. Then, two days after the murder, Larry Stewart turns himself into the Clinton Township Police Station. He's not seen a doctor since his gunshot wound to the arm, and he's weak and desperate for medical attention. He turned himself in because he ran out of options. He's got nowhere to go. He also probably knows if you go to the hospital with a gunshot wound, they have to call the police. One of the first things he tells the police is he's cold and he's hungry and he's in pain. He is treated for his wound, then he is immediately taken into custody. Seven months after the murder, Renata Hamilton and Larry Stewart are tried for murder. Both Larry and Renata were tried together because they did the crime together. They planned the crime and carried out the crime together. Neither blame each other for Kevin's death but neither take responsibility either. Renata's defense was though she helped bring him there, she didn't know there was going to be a robbery. She didn't know that Larry was going to use the gun. Larry told police that he thought Renata was cheating on him with Kevin. So he, that morning, confronted Kevin, and Kevin is the one that pulled the gun so Larry says he was just defending himself. Six months after Kevin's murder, Renata Hamilton and Larry Stewart are convicted of armed robbery, murder, and conspiracy. Both are given mandatory life sentences without parole. I really do think that she thought that her penalties, if convicted, would be much less than uh, what Larry would get because he's the trigger man. I don't think she realized at all that she was gonna be looking at life in prison. Renata made choices based on her heart and not her head, and the consequences were disastrous. The death of an innocent man and Renata herself now spending the rest of her life in jail. I would hope that She's regretful. I mean, for the love of a man, you you throw it all away. It's mind boggling, but some people are desperate for love and affection, no matter how it comes. I would hope that Renata Hamilton has some regrets for participating in the murder of Kevin Brown. This is truly a tragic ending to this girl's first and only chance at love. She'll never have another chance at romance again. Renata was in love. It was Renata who loved Larry. It was Renata who sacrificed for Larry. It was Renata who changed her life for Larry. And in the end, he didn't love her. 
and what she did for him cost Kevin Brown his life.
Yes Thôi áp lực lắm Lên danh Lên danh thì lên thật nhưng mà áp lực lắm không lên không chơi nữa Có tí có hai đứa nhưng mà tí nữa nó đi đi học Tầm Để kiếm tim chơi ạ